Chapter 3.30, Part 1 of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America during the years 1799 to 1804, Volume 3, by Alexander von Humboldt, translated by Thomasina Ross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3.30, Part 1 Passage from Trinidad to Cuba to Rio Sinu, Cartagena, Air Volcanoes of Turbaco, Canal of Mahates. On the morning of the 17th of March, we came within sight of the most eastern island of the group of the Lesser Caymans. Comparing the reckoning with the chronometric longitude, I ascertained that the currents had borne us in 17 hours, 20 miles westward. The island is called by the English pilots Cayman Brack, and by the Spanish pilots Cayman Chico Oriental. It forms a rocky wall, bare and steep toward the south and southeast. The north and northwest part is low, sandy, and scantily covered with vegetation. The rock is broken into narrow horizontal ledges. From its whiteness and its proximity to the island of Cuba, I suppose it to be of Jura limestone. We approached the eastern extremity of Cayman Brack within the distance of four hundred toises. The neighboring coast is not entirely free from danger and breakers, yet the temperature of the sea had not sensibly diminished at its surface. The chronometer of Louis Berthoud gave me 82 degrees 7 minutes 37 seconds for the longitude of the eastern cape of Cayman Brack. The latitude reduced by the reckoning on the rums of wind at the meridian observation appeared to me to be 19 degrees 40 minutes 50 seconds. As long as we were within sight of the rock of Cayman Brack, sea turtles of extraordinary dimensions swam round our vessel. The abundance of these animals led Columbus to give the whole group of the Caymans the name of Penascales de las Tortugas, rocks of the turtles. Our sailors would have thrown themselves into the water to catch some of these animals, but the numerous sharks that accompanied them rendered the attempt too perilous. The sharks fixed their jaws on great iron hooks, which were flung to them. These hooks were very sharp and, for want of anzuelos and condenados, fish hooks with chains, they were tied to cords. The sharks were in this manner drawn up half the length of their bodies, and we were surprised to see that those which had their mouths wounded and bleeding continued to seize the bait over and over again during several hours. Note. Vitimus quoque squales, quoties cumque homo icti, dimidia parte corporis, e fluctibus extra habantur, cito alvo stercus, emiteri hod absimile excrementis, caninus, como vabat intestina, ut arbitrimur, subitus parver. Although the form and number of teeth change with age, and the teeth appear successively in the shark genus, I doubt whether Don Antonio Uloa be correct in stating that the young sharks have two, and the old ones four rows of grinders. These, like many other sea fish, are easily accustomed to live in fresh water, or in water slightly briny. It is observed that sharks, tiburones, abound of late in the laguna of Maracaibo, whither they have been attracted by the dead bodies thrown into the water after the frequent battles between the Spanish royalists and the Colombian republicans. End of note. At the sight of these voracious fish, the sailors in a Spanish vessel always recollect the local fable of the coast of Venezuela, which describes the benediction of a bishop as having softened the habits of the sharks, which are everywhere else the dread of mariners. Do these wild sharks of the port of La Guaira specifically differ from those which are so formidable in the port of the Havana? And do the former belong to the group of emisoles with small sharp teeth, which Cuvier distinguishes from the Melandrus by the name of Mustelli? The wind freshened more and more from the southeast, as we advanced in the direction of Cape Negril and the western extremity of the great bank of La Vibora. We were often forced to diverge from our course, and, on account of the extreme smallness of our vessel, we were almost constantly under water. On the 18th of March at noon, we found ourselves in latitude 18 degrees 17 minutes 40 seconds, and in 41 degrees 50 minutes longitude. The horizon, to the height of 50 degrees, was covered with those reddish vapors so common within the tropics, and which never seem to affect the hygrometer at the surface of the globe. We passed 50 miles west of Cape Negril on the south, nearly at the point where several charts indicate an insulated flat of which the position is similar to that of Sancho Pardo 
opposite to Cape San Antonio de Cuba. We saw no change in the bottom. It appears that the rocky shoal, at a depth of four fathoms near Cape Negril, has no more existence than the rock, Cascabel, itself, long believed to mark the western extremity of La Vibora, Pedro Bank, Portland Rock, or La Sola, marking the eastern extremity. On the 19th of March, at four in the afternoon, the muddy colour of the sea denoted that we had reached that part of the bank of La Vibora, where we no longer find fifteen, and indeed scarcely nine or ten, fathoms of water. Our chronometric longitude was eighty-one degrees three minutes, and our latitude probably below seventeen degrees. I was surprised that, at the noon observation, at seventy degrees seven minutes of latitude, we yet perceived no change in the colour of the water. Spanish vessels, going from Batabana or Trinidad de Cuba to Cartagena, usually pass over the bank of La Vibora, on its western side, at between fifteen and sixteen fathoms of water. The dangers of the breakers begin only beyond the meridian of eighty degrees, forty-five minutes west longitude. In passing along the bank on its southern limit, as pilots often do, in proceeding from Cumana or other parts of the mainland, to the Great Cayman, or Cape San Antonio, they need not ascend along the rocks, above 16 degrees 47 minutes latitude. Fortunately, the currents run, on the whole bank, to southwest. Considering La Vibora not as a submerged land, but as a heaved-up part of the surface of the globe, which has not reached the level of the sea, we are struck at finding on this great submarine island, as on the neighboring land of Jamaica and Cuba, the loftiest heights toward its eastern boundary. In that direction are situated Portland Rock, Pedro Keys, and South Key, all surrounded by dangerous breakers. The depth is six or eight fathoms, but, in advancing to the middle of the bank along the line of the summit, first toward the west, and then toward the northwest, the depth becomes successively ten, twelve, sixteen, and nineteen fathoms. When we survey on the map the proximity of the high lands of San Domingo, Cuba, and Jamaica, in the neighborhood of the Windward Channel, the position of the island of Navaza, and the bank of Hormigas, between Capes Tiburon and Morant, when we trace that chain of successive breakers, from the Vibora by Bajo Nuevo, Serrania, and Quitas Sueno, as far as the Mosquito Sound, we cannot but recognize in this system of islands and shoals the almost continued line of a heaved-up ridge running from northeast to southwest. This ridge and the old dike, which link by the rock of San Pardo, Cape San Antonio, to the peninsula of Yucatan, divide the great sea of the West Indies into three partial basins, similar to those observed in the Mediterranean. The color of the troubled waters on the shoal of La Vibora has not a milky appearance, like the waters in the Jardinios and on the bank of Bahama, but is of a dirty gray color. The striking differences of tint on the bank of Newfoundland, in the archipelago of the Bahama Islands, and on La Vibora, the variable quantities of earthy matter, suspended in more or less troubled waters of the soundings, may all be the effects of the variable absorption of the rays of light, contributing to modify to a certain point the temperature of the sea, where the shoals are eight to ten degrees colder at their surface than the surrounding sea. It cannot be surprising that they should produce a local change of climate. A great mass of very cold water, as on the bank of Newfoundland, in the current of the Peruvian shore between the port of Callao and Punta Parina. Note, I found the surface of the Pacific Ocean in the month of October 1802 on the coast of Trujillo, 15.8 degrees centigrade, in the port of Callao, in November 15.5, between the parallel of Callao and Punta Parina, in December, 19 degrees, and progressively, when the current advanced toward the equator and receded toward the west-northwest, 20.5 and 22.3 degrees, end of note, or in the African current near Cape Verde, have necessarily an influence on the atmosphere that covers the sea and on the climate of the neighboring land. But it is less easy to conceive that those slight changes of temperature, for instance, a centesimal degree on the bank of La Vibora, can impart a peculiar character to the atmosphere of the shoals. May not these submarine islands act upon the formation and accumulation of the vesicular vapors in some other way than by cooling the waters of the surface? Quitting the bank of La Vibora, we passed between the Bajo Nuevo and the lighthouse of Camboy, and on the 22nd March we passed more than thirty leagues to the westward of El Roncador, the snorer, 
a name which this shoal has received from the pilots who assert, on the authority of ancient traditions, that a sound like snoring is heard from afar. If such a sound be really heard, it arises no doubt from a periodical issuing of air compressed by the waters in a rocky cavern. I have observed the same phenomenon on several coasts, for instance, on the promontories of Tenerife, in the limestones of the Havana, note, called by the Spanish sailors El Condorazo de San Francisco, end of note, and in the granite of Lower Peru, between Trujillo and Lima. A project was formed in the Canary Islands for placing a machine at the issue of the compressed air, and allowing the sea to act as an impelling force. When the autumnal equinox is everywhere dreaded in the sea of the West Indies, except on the coast of Cumaná and Caracas, the spring equinox produces no effect on the tranquillity of those tropical regions, a phenomenon almost the inverse of that observable in high latitudes. Since we had quitted La Vibora, the weather had been remarkably fine. The color of the sea was indigo blue and sometimes violet, owing to the quantity of medusae and eggs of fish, purga de mar, which covered it. Its surface was gently agitated. The thermometer kept up in the shade from 26 to 27 degrees. Not a cloud arose on the horizon, although the wind was constantly north or north-northwest. I know not whether to attribute this wind, which cools the higher layers of the atmosphere and then produces icy crystals, to the halos which were formed round the moon two nights successively. The halos were of small dimensions, 45 degrees diameter. I never had an opportunity of seeing and measuring any of which the diameter had attained 90 degrees. Note. In Captain Perry's first voyage, halos were measured round the sun and moon, of which the rays were 22 and one half degrees, 22 degrees 52 minutes, 38 degrees 46 degrees. Northwest Passage, 1821. End of note. The disappearance of one of those lunar halos was followed by the formation of a great black cloud, from which fell some drops of rain, but the sky soon resumed its fixed serenity, and we saw a long series of falling stars and bolides, which moved in one direction, and contrary to that of the wind of the lower strata. On the 23rd March, a comparison of the reckoning with the chronometric longitude indicated the force of a current bearing towards west-southwest. Its swiftness, in the parallel of seventeen degrees, was twenty to twenty-two miles in twenty-four hours. I found the temperature of the sea somewhat diminished. In latitude twelve degrees thirty-five minutes, it was only twenty-five point nine degrees, air twenty-seven point zero degrees. During the whole day, the firmament exhibited a spectacle which was thought remarkable even by the sailors, and which I had observed on a previous occasion, June thirteenth, seventeen ninety-nine. There was a total absence of clouds, even of those light vapors called dry, yet the sun colored, with a fine rosy tint, the air, and the horizon of the sea. Towards night the sea was covered with great bluish clouds, and when they disappeared we saw at an immense height fleecy clouds in regular spaces, and ranged in convergent bands. Their direction was from north-northwest to south-southeast, or more exactly, north twenty degrees west, consequently contrary to the direction of the magnetic meridian. On the 24th March, we entered the gulf which is bounded on the east by the coast of Santa Marta, and on the west by Costa Rica, for the mouth of the Magdalena and that of the Rio San Juan de Nicaragua are on the same parallel, nearly 11 degrees latitude. The proximity of the Pacific Ocean, the configuration of the neighboring lands, the smallness of the Isthmus of Panama, the lowering of the soil between the Gulf of Papageo and the port of San Juan de Nicaragua, the vicinity of the snowy mountains of Santa Marta, and many other circumstances too numerous to mention, combine to create a peculiar climate in this gulf. The atmosphere is agitated by violent gales known in winter by the name of Prisotes de Santa Marta. When the wind abates, the currents bear to northeast, and the conflict between the slight breezes from east and northeast, and the current renders the sea rough and agitated. In calm weather, the vessels going from Cartagena to Rio Sinu, at the mouth of the Atrato, and at Portobello, are impeded in their course by the currents of the coast. The heavier brisote winds, on the contrary, govern the movement of the waters, which they impel in an opposite direction, toward west-southwest. It is the latter movement which Major Brunel, in his great hydrographic work, calls drift, and he distinguishes it from real currents, which are not owing to the local action of the wind, but to differences of level in the surface of the ocean, to the rising and accumulation of waters in very distant latitudes. 
the observations which i have collected on the force and the direction of the winds on the temperature and rapidity of the currents on the influence of the seasons or the variable declination of the sun have thrown some light on the complicated system of those pelagic floods that furrow the surface of the ocean but it is less easy to conceive the causes of the change in the movement of the waters at the same season and with the same wind why is the gulf stream sometimes borne on the coast of florida sometimes on the border of the shoal of bahama why do the waters flow for the space of whole weeks from the havana to matanzas and to cite an example of the corriente por arriba which is sometimes observed in the most eastern part of the mainland during the prevalence of gentle winds from la guayra to cape codera and cumana as we advanced on the twenty fifth of march toward the coast of darien the north-east wind increased with violence we might have imagined ourselves transported to another climate the sea became very rough during the night yet the temperature of the water kept up from latitude ten degrees thirty minutes to nine degrees forty seven minutes at twenty five point eight degrees we perceived at sunrise a part of the archipelago of st bernard which closes the gulf of morosquillo on the north Note, it is composed of the islands mucara seisen maravilla tintipan panda palma mangles and salamanquilla which rise little above the sea several of them have the form of a bastion there are two passages in the middle of this archipelago from seventeen to twenty fathoms large vessels can pass between the isla panda and tintipan and between the isla mangles and palma end of note a clear spot between the clouds enabled me to take the horary angles the chronometer at the little island of mucara gave longitude seventy eight degrees thirteen minutes fifty four seconds we passed on the southern extremity of the placer de san bernardo the waters were milky though a sounding of twenty five fathoms did not indicate the bottom the cooling of the water was not felt doubtless owing to the rapidity of the current above the archipelago of st bernard and cape Bocaron, we saw in the distance the mountains of tigua the stormy weather and the difficulty of going up against the wind induced the captain of our frail vessel to seek shelter in the rio Sinu, or rather near the punta del zapote situated on the eastern bank of the ensenada de cispata into which flows the river Sinu or the zenu of the early conquistadors it rained with violence and i availed myself of that occasion to measure the temperature of the rainwater it was twenty six point three degrees while the thermometer in the air kept up in a place where the bulb was not wet at twenty four point eight degrees this result differed much from that we had obtained at cumana where the rainwater was often a degree colder than the air note as within the tropics it takes but little time to collect some inches of water in a vase having a wide opening and narrowing toward the bottom i do not think there can be any error in the observation when the heat of the rainwater differs from that of the air if the heat of the rainwater be less than that of the air it may be presumed that only a part of the total effect is observed i often found at mexico at the end of june the rain at nineteen point two or nineteen point four degrees when the air was at seventeen point eight and eighteen degrees in general it appeared to me that within the torrid zone either at the level of the sea or on table-lands from twelve hundred to fifteen hundred toises high there is no rain but that during storms which falls in very large drops very distant from each other and is sensibly colder than the air these drops bring with them no doubt the low temperature of the high regions in the rain which i found hotter than the air two causes may act simultaneously great clouds heat by the absorption of the rays of the sun which strike their surface and the drops of water in falling cause an evaporation and produce cold in the air the temperature of rain-water to which i devoted much attention during my travels has become a more important problem since m boisgiro professor of experimental philosophy at poitiers has proved that in europe rain is generally sufficiently cold relative to the air to cause precipitation of vapour at the surface of every drop from this fact he traces the cause of the unequal quantity of rain collected at different heights when we recollect that one degree only of cooling precipitates more water in the hot climate of the tropics than by a temperature of ten to thirteen degrees we may cease to be surprised at the enormous size of the drops of rain that fall at cumana cartagena and guayaquil End of note. 
our passage from the island of cuba to the coast of south america terminated at the mouth of the rio sinu and occupied sixteen days the roadstead near the punta del zabote afforded very bad anchorage and in a rough sea and with a violent wind we found some difficulty in reaching the coast in our canoe everything denoted that we had entered a wild region rarely visited by strangers a few scattered houses formed the village of zapote we found a great number of mariners assembled under a sort of shed all men of colour who had descended the rio sinu in their barks to carry maize bananas poultry and other provisions to the port of cartagena these barks which are from fifty to eighty feet long belong for the most part to the planters haciendados of lorica the value of their largest freight amounts to about two thousand piastres these boats are flat-bottomed and cannot keep at sea when it is very rough the breezes from the northeast had during ten days blown with violence on the coast while in the open sea as far as ten degrees latitude we had only had slight gales and a constantly calm sea in the aerial as in the pelagic currents some layers of fluids move with extreme swiftness while others near them remain almost motionless the zambos of the rio sinu wearied us with idle questions respecting the purpose of our voyage our books and the use of our instruments they regarded us with mistrust and to escape from their importunate curiosity we went to herborize in the forest although it rained they had endeavoured as usual to alarm us by stories of boas traga venado vipers and the attacks of jaguars but during a long residence among the chema indians of the orinoco we were habituated to these exaggerations which arise less from the credulity of the natives than from the pleasure they take in tormenting the whites End of chapter three point thirty part one chapter three point thirty part two of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point thirty part two quitting the coast of zapote covered with mangroves note rise of a mangle End of note. We entered a forest remarkable for a great variety of palm trees. We saw the trunks of the Corozo del Sinu pressed against each other, which formed heretofore our species Alfonsia, yielding oil in abundance. Note. In Spanish America, palm trees with leaves the most different in kind and species are called Corozo. The Corozo del Sinu, with a short, thick, glossy trunk, is the Aleus melanococca of Martius, palm page sixty four tab thirty three fifty five i cannot believe it to be identical with the laeus guineensis herbal of congo river page thirty seven since it vegetates spontaneously in the forests of the rio sinu the corozo of caripe is slender small and covered with thorns it approaches the cocos aculeata of jacquin the corozo de los marinos of the valley of cauca one of the tallest palm trees is the cocos butyracea of Linnaeus. End of note. The Cocos Butyracea, called here Pompandolce, or Palma Real, and very different from the Palma Real of the island of Cuba, the Palma Amarga, with fan leaves that serve to cover the roofs of houses, and the Lata, note, perhaps of the species Aphanis, end of note, resembling the small Piritu palm tree of the Orinoco. This variety of palm trees was remarked by the first conquistadors. Note, pedro de sieca de leon a native of seville who travelled in fifteen thirty one at the age of thirteen years in the countries i have described observes that las tierras comarcanas del rio sinu y del golfo de uraba están llenas de unos palmeres muy grandes y espresos que son unos arboles gruesos y levan unas ramas como palma de datiles the lands adjacent to the rio sinu and the gulf of uraba are full of very tall spreading palm trees they are of vast size and are much branched like the palm tree see la cronica del peru nuevamente escrita antwerp fifteen fifty four pages twenty one and two hundred and four end of note the alfonsia or rather the species of aleus which we had nowhere else seen is only six feet high with a very large trunk 
and the fecundity of its spathes is such that they contain more than two hundred thousand flowers although a great number of those flowers one tree bearing six hundred thousand at the same time never come to maturity the soil remains covered with a thick layer of fruits Note, i have carefully counted how many flowers are contained in a square inch on each amentum from one hundred to one hundred and twenty of which are found united in one spathe end of note we often made a similar observation under the shade of the mauritia palm tree the cocos butyracea the seya and the pihiguao of the atabapo no other family of arborescent plants is so prolific in the development of the organs of flowering the almond of the corosa del sinu is peeled in the water the thick layer of oil that swims in the water is purified by boiling and yields the butter of corozo manteca de corozo which is thicker than the oil of the cocoa tree and serves to light churches and houses the palm trees of the section of cocoanies of mr brown are the olive trees of the tropical regions as we advanced in the forest we began to find little pathways looking as though they had been recently cleared out by the hatchet their windings displayed a great number of new plants mujotia mollis nelsonia albicans melampodium pedulosum genidium anomalum tucrium palustra gomphia lucens and a new kind of composes the spiracantha cornifolia a fine pancratium embalmed the air in the human spots and almost made us forget that these gloomy and marshy forests are highly dangerous to health after an hour's walk we found in a cleared spot several inhabitants employed in collecting palm tree wine the dark tint of the zambos formed a strong contrast with the appearance of a little man with light hair and a pale complexion who seemed to take no share in the labor i thought at first that he was a sailor who had escaped from some north american vessel but i was soon undeceived this fair-complexioned man was my countryman born on the coast of the baltic he had served in the danish navy and had lived for several years in the upper part of the rio sinu near santa cruz de lorica he had come to use the words of the loungers of the country para ver tierras y pasiera no mas to see other lands and to roam about nothing else the sight of a man who could speak to him of his country seemed to have no attraction for him and as he had almost forgotten german without being able to express himself clearly in spanish our conversation was not very animated during the five years of my travels in spanish america i found only two opportunities of speaking my native language the first prussian i met with was a sailor from memel who served on board a ship from halifax and who refused to make himself known till after he had fired some musket shot at our boat the second the man we had met at the rio Sinu, was very amicably disposed without answering my questions he continued repeating with a smile that the country was hot and humid that the houses in the town of pomerania were finer than those of santa cruz de lorica and that if we remained in the forest we should have the tertian fever calentura from which he had long suffered we had some difficulty in testifying our gratitude to this good man for his kind advice for according to his somewhat aristocratic principles a white man were he barefooted should never accept money quote, in the presence of those vile colored people End quote. Gente parda. Less disdainful than our European countryman, we saluted politely the group of men of color who were employed in drawing off into large calabashes or fruits of the Crescentia cujete, the palm tree wine from the trunks of the felled trees. We asked them to explain to us this operation, which we had already seen practiced in the missions of the cataracts. The vine of the country is the palma dulce, the cocos butyracea, which, near Malgar, in the valley of the Magdalena, is called the wine palm tree, and here, on account of its majestic height, the royal palm tree. After having thrown down the trunk, which diminishes but little toward the top, they make just below the point where the leaves, fronds, and spathes issue, an excavation in the ligneous part, eighteen inches long, eight broad, and six in depth. They work in the hollow of the tree, as though they were making a canoe, and three days afterwards this cavity is found filled with a yellowish-white juice very limpid with a sweet and vinous flavor the fermentation appears to commence as soon as the trunk falls but the vessels preserve their vitality for we saw that the sap flowed even when the summit of the palm tree that part whence the leaves sprout out 
is a foot higher than the lower end, near the roots. The sap continues to mount, as in the arborescent euphorbia recently cut. During eighteen to twenty days, the palm tree wine is daily collected. The last is less sweet but more alcoholic, and more highly esteemed. One tree yields as much as eighteen bottles of sap, each bottle containing forty-two cubic inches. The natives affirm that the flowing is more abundant when the petioles of the leaves, which remain fixed to the trunk, are burnt. The great humidity and thickness of the forest forced us to retrace our steps, and to gain the shore before sunset. In several places the compact limestone rock, probably of tertiary formation, is visible. A thick layer of clay and mould rendered observation difficult, but a shelf of carburetted and shining slate seemed to me to indicate the presence of more ancient formations. It has been affirmed that coal is to be found on the banks of the sinew. We met with Zambos carrying on their shoulders the cylinders of palmetto, improperly called the cabbage palm, three feet long and five to six feet thick. The stem of the palm tree has been for ages an esteemed article of food in those countries. I believe it to be wholesome, although historians relate that, when Alonso Lopez de Ayala was governor of Uraba, several Spaniards died, after having eaten immoderately of the palmetto, and at the same time drinking a great quantity of water. In comparing the herbaceous and nourishing fibres of the young undeveloped leaves of the palm trees with the sago of Mauritia, of which the Indians make bread similar to that of the root of the Hatrofa manihot, we involuntarily recollect the striking analogy which modern chemistry has proved to exist between ligneous matter and the amylaceous fecula. We stopped on the shore to collect lichens, opigraphus, and a great number of mosses, bolitus, hydnum, helvella, telephora, that were attached to the mangroves, and there, to my great surprise, vegetating, although moistened by the sea water. Before I quit this coast, so seldom visited by travellers, and described by no modern voyager, I may here offer some information which I acquired during my stay at Cartagena. The Rio Sinu, in its upper course, approaches the tributary streams of the Atrato, which, to the auriferous and platiniferous province of Choco, is of the same importance as the Magdalena to Cundinamarca, or the Rio Cauca to the provinces of Antioquia and Popayan. The three great rivers here mentioned have heretofore been the only commercial routes, I might almost add, the only channels of communication for the inhabitants. The Rio Atrato receives, at twelve leagues distance from its mouth, the Rio Suquillo on the east. The Indian village of San Antonio is situated on its banks. Proceeding upward, beyond the Rio Pabarando, you arrive in the valley of Sinu. After several fruitless attempts on the part of the Archbishop Gongora, to establish colonies in Darien del Norte, and on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Uraba, the Viceroy, Espeleta, recommended the Spanish government to fix its whole attention on the Rio Sinu, to destroy the colony of Cayman, to fix the planters in the Spanish village of San Bernardo del Viento, in the jurisdiction of Lorica, and from that post, which is the most westerly, to push forward the peaceful conquests of agriculture and civilization towards the banks of the Paparando, the Rio Suquillo, and the Atrato. Note. I will here state some facts which I obtained from official documents during my stay at Cartagena, and which have not yet been published. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the name of Darien was given vaguely to the whole coast, extending from the Rio d'Amaquiel to the Punta de San Blas, on two and one-quarters degrees of longitude. The cruelties exercised by Pedrarias Davila rendered almost inaccessible to the Spaniards a country which was one of the first they had colonized. The Indians, Darians and Cunas Cunas, remained masters of the coast, as they still are at Poyeas, in the land of the Mosquitoes. Some Scotchmen formed, in 1698, the settlements of New Caledonia, New Edinburgh, and Scotch Port, in the most eastern part of the Isthmus, a little west of Punta Carreto. They were soon driven away by the Spaniards, but, as the latter occupied no part of the coast, the Indians continued their attacks against Choco's boats, which from time to time descended the Rio Atrato. The sanguinary expedition of Don Manuel de Alderete in 1729 served only to augment the resentment of the natives. A settlement for the cultivation of the cocoa tree 
attempted in the territory of Urabia in 1740 by some French planters under the protection of the Spanish government had no durable success, and the court, excited by the reports of the Archbishop Viceroy Gongora, ordered by the cedule of the 15th August, 1783, either the conversion and conquest or the destruction, reducion u extinción of the Indians of Darien. This order, worthy of another age, was executed by Don Antonio de Arbalo. He experienced little resistance and formed, in 1785, the four settlements and forts of Cayman, on the eastern coast of the Gulf of Arabia, Concepcion, Carolina, and Mandinga. The Lele, or High Priest of Mandinga, took an oath of fidelity to the King of Spain, but in 1786 the war with the Darien Indians recommenced, and was terminated by a treaty concluded July 27, 1878, between the Archbishop Viceroy and the Cacique Bernardo. The forts and new colonies, which figured only on the maps sent to Madrid, augmented the debt of the treasury of Santa Fe de Bogota in 1789 to the sum of one million two hundred thousand piastres. The viceroy, Hill Lemos, wiser than his predecessor, obtained permission from the court to abandon Carolina, Concepcion, and Mandinga. The settlement of Cayman only was preserved on account of the navigation of the Atrato, and it was declared free under the government of the archbishop viceroy. It was proposed to transfer this settlement to a more healthy spot, that of Uraba, but Lieutenant General Don Antonio Arabalo, having proved that the expense of this removal would amount to the sum of 40,000 piastres, the fort of Cayman was also destroyed, by order of the viceroy Espeleta, in 1791, and the planters were compelled to join those of the village of San Bernardo. End of note. The number of independent Indians who inhabit the lands between Uraba, Rio Atrato, Rio Suquillo, and Rio Sinu, was, according to a census made in 1760, at least 1800. They were distributed in three small villages, Suraba, Tonequi, and Haraguia. This population was computed, at the period when I travelled there, to be 3,000. The natives, comprehended in the general name of Caymans, live at peace with the inhabitants of San Bernardo del Viento, Pueblo de Españoles, situated on the western bank of the Rio Sino, lower than San Nicolas de Zispata, and near the mouth of the river. These people have not the ferocity of the Darien and Cunas Indians, on the left bank of the Atrato, who often attack the boats trading with the town of Cuidbo, in the Choco. They also make incursions on the territory of Uraba, in the months of June and November, to collect the fruit of the cacao trees. The cacao of Uraba is of excellent quality, and the Darien Indians sometimes come to sell it, with other productions, to the inhabitants of Rio Sinu, entering the valley of that river by one of its tributary streams, the Haraguay. It cannot be doubted that the Gulf of Darien was considered, at the beginning of the 16th century, as a nook in the country of the Caribs. The word Caribana is still preserved in the name of the eastern cape of that gulf. We know nothing of the languages of the Darien, Cunas, and Cayman Indians, and we know not whether Carib or Arawak words are found in their idioms. But it is certain, notwithstanding the testimony of Anguira, on the identity of the race of the Caribs of the Lesser Antilles, and the Indians of Urapa, that Pedro de Sieca, who lived so long among the latter, never calls them Caribs, or cannibals. He describes the race of that tribe as being naked, with long hair, and going to the neighboring countries to trade, and says the women are cleanly, well-dressed, and extremely engaging. Amorosas y galanas. Quote, I have not seen, end quote, adds the conquistador, quote, any women more beautiful in all the Indian lands I have visited. They have one fault, however, that of having too frequent intercourse with the devil, end quote. Note. Cronica del Peru, pages 21 and 22. The Indians of Darien, Uraba, Zenu, Sinu, Tatabi, the valleys of Nori and of Guauca, the mountains of Abibe and Antioquia are accused, by the same author, of the most ferocious cannibalism, and perhaps that circumstance alone gives rise to the idea that they were of the same race as the Caribs of the West Indies. In the celebrated Provision Real of the 30th of October, 1503, 
by which the Spaniards are permitted to make slaves of the anthropophagic Indians of the archipelago of San Bernardo, opposite the mouth of the Rio Sinu, the Irafuerta, Irabura, Baru, and Cartagena, there is more of a question of morals than of race, and the denomination of Caribs is altogether avoided. Sieca asserts that the natives of the Valley of Nore seized the women of the neighboring tribes in order first to devour the children who were born of the union with foreign wives and then the women themselves foreseeing that this horrible depravity would not be believed although it had been observed by columbus in the west indies he cites the testimony of juan de vadillo who had observed the same facts and who was still living in fifteen fifty four when the chronica del peru appeared in dutch with respect to the etymology of the word cannibal it seems to me entirely cleared up by the discovery of the journal kept by Columbus during his first voyage of discovery, and of which Bartholomew de las Casas has left us an abridged copy. Dice mas el almirante, que an las islas pasadas esteban con gran timor de Carib, y an algunas los llamaban canaba, pero an la española Carib y son gente arriscada, pues andan por todas estas islas y comen la gente que pueden haber and the admiral moreover says that in the islands they passed great apprehension was entertained on account of the caribs some call them cannibas but in spanish they are called caribs they were very bold people and they travelled about these islands and devour all the persons whom they capture navarrete tome one page one hundred and thirty five in this primitive form of words, it is easy to perceive that the permutation of the letters R and N, resulting from the imperfection of the organs in some nations, might change carib into canib or caniba. Geraldini, who, according to the tendency of that age, sought, like Cardinal Bembo, to Latinize all barbarous denominations, recognizes in the cannibals the manners of dogs, canes, just as St. Louis desired to send the Tartars, ad suas tartareas sedes unde exierant. End of note. The Rio Sinu, owing to its position and its fertility, is of the highest importance for provisioning Cartagena. In time of war, the enemy usually stationed their ships between the Moro de Tigua and the Boca de Matunia to intercept barks laden with provisions. In that station, they were, however, sometimes exposed to the attack of the gunboats of Cartagena. These gunboats can pass through the channel of Pasacabeos, which, near St. Anne, separates the Isle of Baru from the continent. Lorca has, since the 16th century, been the principal town of Rio Sinu, but its population, which, in 1778, under the government of Don Juan Diaz Pimienta, amounted to 4,000 souls, has considerably diminished because nothing has been done to secure the town from inundations and the delirious miasmata they produce. The gold washings of the Rio Sinu, heretofore so important above all between its source and the village of San Jeronimo, have almost entirely ceased, as well as those of the Cienega de Tolu, Uraba, and all the rivers descending from the mountains of Abibe, quote, the Darien and the Zinu, end quote, says the bachelor and Ciso in his geographical work, published at the beginning of the sixteenth century, quote, is a country so rich in gold pepites that, in the running water, the metal can be fished with nets, end quote. Excited by these narratives, the governor, Pedrerius, sent his lieutenant, Francisco Becerra, in 1515, to the Rio Sinu. This expedition was most unfortunate, for Becerra and his troops were massacred by the natives, of whom the Spaniards, according to the custom of the time, had carried away great numbers to be sold as slaves in the West Indies. The province of Antioquia now furnishes, in its auriferous veins, a vast field for mining speculations. But it might be well worth while to relinquish gold washings for the cultivation of colonial productions in the fertile lands of Sinu, the Rio da Maquiel, the Uraba, and the Darien del Norte, above all that of cacao, which is of a superior quality. The proximity of the port of Cartagena would also render the neglected cultivation of cinchona an object of great importance to European trade. That precious tree vegetates at the source of the Rio Sinu, as in the mountains of Abibe and Maria. The real febrifuge cinchona, with a hairy corolla, is nowhere else found so near the coast, 
if we except the Sierra Nevada of Santa Marta. The Rio Sinu and the Gulf of Darien were not visited by Columbus. The most eastern point at which that great man touched land, on the 26th November, 1503, is the Puerto do Retrito, now called Punta de Escribanos, near the Punta of San Blas, in the Isthmus of Panama. Two years previously, Rodrigo de Bastidas and Alonso de Ojeda, accompanied by Amerigo Vespucci, had discovered the whole coast of the mainland, from the Gulf of Maracaibo as far as the Puerto de Retreto. Having often had occasion in the preceding volumes to speak of New Andalusia, I may here mention that I found that denomination for the first time in the convention made by Alonso de Ojeda with the conquistador Diego de Sicuesa, a powerful man, say the historians of his time, because he was a flattering courtier and a wit. In 1508, all the country, from the Cabo de la Vela to the Gulf of Uraba, where the Castillo del Oro begins, was called New Andalusia, a name since restricted to the province of Cumaná. A fortunate chance led me to see, during the course of my travels, the two extremities of the mainland, the mountainous and verdant coast of Paria, which Columbus supposes to have been the cradle of the human race, and the low and humid coast extending from the mouth of the Sinu towards the Gulf of Darien. The comparison of these scenes, which have again relapsed into a savage state, confirms what I have elsewhere advanced relative to the strange and sometimes retrograde nature of civilization in America. On one side, the coast of Paria, the islands of Cubagua and Margarita, on the other, the Gulf of Uraba and Darien, received the first Spanish colonists. Gold and pearls, which were there found in abundance, because from time to time immemorial they had been accumulated in the hands of the natives, gave those countries a popular celebrity from the beginning of the sixteenth century. At Seville, Toledo, Pisa, Genoa, and Antwerp, those countries were viewed like the realms of Ormuz and of Ind. The pontiffs of Rome mentioned them in their bulls, and Bembo has celebrated them in those historical pages which had luster to the glory of Venice. At the close of the fifteenth and the beginning of the sixteenth century, Europe saw, in those parts of the new world discovered by Columbus, Ojeda, Vespucci, and Rodrigo de Bastidas, only the advanced capes of the vast territories of India and eastern Asia. The immense wealth of those territories in gold, diamonds, pearls, and spices had been vaunted in the narratives of Benjamin de Tudela, Rubruquis, Marco Polo, and Mandeville. Columbus, whose imagination was excited by these narrations, caused a deposition to be made before a notary on the 12th of June, 1494, in which sixty of his companions, pilots, sailors, and passengers, certified upon oath that the southern coast of Cuba was a part of the continent of India. The description of the treasures of Cathay and Sipango, of the celestial town of Quince, and the province of Mango, which had fired the admiral's ambition in early life, pursued him like phantoms in his declining days. In his fourth and last voyage, on approaching the coast of Caraya, Poye or Mosquito Coast, Varagua and the Isthmus, he believed himself to be near the mouth of the Ganges. Note. También dicen que la mar baja a Seguare, y de alia a diez jornadas, es un río de Guanges, para que estas tierras están con Veragua como Tortosa, con Fuentarabia o Pisa con Venecia. Also it is said that the sea lowers at Seguara, and from thence it is a ten days' journey to the river Ganges, for these lands are, with reference to Veragua, like Tortosa, with respect to Fuenterabia, or Pisa, with respect to Venice. These words are taken from the Terra Rarissima of Columbus, of which the original Spanish was lately found, and published by the learned Monsieur Navarrete in his Colección de Viages, volume 1, page 299. End of note. These geographical allusions this mysterious veil, which enveloped the first discoveries, contributed to magnify every object, and to fix the attention of Europe on regions, the very names of which are to us scarcely known. New Cadiz, the principal seat of the pearl fishery, was on an island which has again become uninhabited. The extremity of the rocky coast of Paria is also a desert. Several towns were founded at the mouth of the Rio Atrato by the names of Antiguel del Darien, Uraba, or San Sebastian de Buenavista. In these spots, so celebrated at the beginning of the sixteenth century, 
the historians of the conquest tell us that the flower of the castilian heroes were found assembled thence balboa set out to discover the south sea pizarro marched from thence to conquer and ravage peru and pedro de sieca constantly followed the chain of the andes by antioquia popayan and cusco as far as la plata after having gone nine hundred leagues by land these towns of darien are destroyed some ruins scattered on the hills of uraba the fruit trees of europe mixed with native trees are all that mark to the traveller the spots on which those towns once stood in almost all spanish america the first lands peopled by the conquistadors have retrograded into barbarism Note. in carefully collating the testimonies of the historians of the conquest some contradictions are observed in the periods assigned to the foundation of the towns of darien pedro de sieca who had been on the spot affirms that under the government of alonso de ojeda and nicuesa the town of nuestra senora santa maria el antagua de darien was founded on the western coast of the gulf or culata de uraba in fifteen o nine and that later despues desto pasado ojeda passed to the eastern coast of the culata to construct the town of san sebastian de uraba the former called by abbreviation cuidad del antigua had soon a population of two thousand spaniards while the latter the cuidad de uraba remained uninhabited because francisco pizarro since known as the conqueror of peru was forced to abandon it having vainly demanded succor from saint domingo the historian herrera after having said that the foundation of antigua had preceded by one year that of uraba or san sebastian affirms the contrary in the following chapter and in the chronicle itself it was according to the chronicle in fifteen o one that ojeda accompanied by vespucci and penetrating for the first time the gulf of uraba or darien resolved to construct with wood and unbaked bricks a fort at the entrance of culata it appears however that this enterprise was not executed for in fifteen o eight in the convention made by ojeda and nicuesa they each promised to build two fortresses on the limits of new andalusia and of castillo del oro herrera in the seventh and eighth books of the first decade fixes the foundation of san sebastian de uraba at the beginning of fifteen ten and mentions it as the most ancient town of the continent of america after that of seragua founded by columbus in fifteen o three on the rio belen he relates how francisco pizarro abandoned that town and how the foundation of the cuidad del antigua by antiso towards the end of the year fifteen ten was the consequence of that event leo x made antigua a bishopric in fifteen fourteen and this was the first episcopal church of the continent in fifteen nineteen pedrarius de villa persuaded the court of madrid by false reports that the site of the new town of panama was more healthful than that of antigua the inhabitants were compelled to abandon the latter town and the bishopric was transferred to panama the gulf of uraba was deserted during thirteen years till the founder of the town of cartagena pedro de heredia after having dug up the graves or huacas of the rio sinu to collect gold sent his brother alonso in fifteen thirty two to repeople uraba and construct on that spot a town under the name of san sebastian de buena vista End of note. other countries discovered later attract the attention of the colonists such is the natural progress of things in peopling a vast continent it may be hoped that on several points the people will return to the places that were first chosen it is difficult to conceive why the mouth of a great river descending from a country rich in gold and platina should have remained uninhabited the atrato heretofore called rio del darien or san juan or Dadabaya, has had the same fate as the orinoco the indians who wander around the delta of those rivers continue in a savage state end of chapter three point thirty part two chapter three point thirty part three of personal narrative of travels to the equinoctial regions of america during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by alexander von humboldt translated by thomasina ross this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three point thirty part three 
we weighed anchor in the road of zapote on the twenty seventh march at sunrise the sea was less stormy and the weather rather warmer although the fury of the wind was undiminished we saw on the north a succession of small cones of extraordinary form as far as the moro de tigua they are known by the name of the paps tetas of santero tolu rincon and chichimar the two latter are nearest the coast the tetas de tolu rise in the middle of the savannas there from the trunks of the toluifera balsamum is collected the precious balsam of tolu heretofore so celebrated in the pharmacopias of europe and in which is a profitable article of trade at corozal caimito and the town of tocosuan in the savannas altas del tulu oxen and mules wander half wild several of those hills between the cienego de pesquero and the punta del camisario are linked two and two together like balsamic columns it is however very probable that they are calcareous like the tetas de managua south of the havana in the archipelago of san bernardo we passed between the island of salamanquilla and cape bocaron we had scarcely quitted the gulf of morosquillo when the sea became so rough that the waves frequently washed over the deck of our little vessel it was a fine moonlight night our captain sought in vain a sheltering place on the coast to the north of the village of rincon we cast anchor at four fathoms but having discovered that we were lying over a reef of coral we preferred the open sea the coast has a singular configuration beyond the moro de tigua the terminatory point of the group of little mountains which rise like islands from the plain we found at first a marshy soil extending over a square of eight leagues between the bocas de matanu and matunilla these marshes are connected by the cieniga de la cruz with the dequa of mahates in the rio magdalena the island of baru which with the island of tierra bomba forms the vast port of cartagena is properly speaking but a peninsula fourteen miles long separated from the continent by the narrow channel of pasacaballos the archipelago of san bernardo is situated opposite to cape bocaron another archipelago called rosario lies off the southern point of the peninsula of baru these rents in the coast are repeated at ten and three quarters and eleven degrees of latitude the peninsula is near the ensenada of galera de zamba and near the port of savania have the same aspect as the peninsula baru similar causes have produced similar effects and the geologist must not neglect those analogies in the configuration of a coast which from puta caravana and the mouth of the atrato beyond the cape of la vela along an extent of one hundred and twenty leagues has a general direction from south-west to north-east the wind having dropped during the night we could only advance to the island of arinas where we anchored i found it was seventy-eight degrees two minutes ten seconds of longitude the weather became stormy during the night we again set sail on the morning of twenty ninth of march hoping to be able to reach boca chica on that day the gale blew with extreme violence and we were unable to proceed with our frail bark against the wind and the current when by a false manoeuvre in setting the sails we had but four sailors we were during some minutes in imminent danger the captain who was not a very old mariner declined to proceed further up the coast and we took refuge sheltered from the wind in a nook of the island of baru south of punta gigantes it was palm sunday and the zambo who had accompanied us to the orinoco and did not leave us till we returned to france reminded us that on the same sunday in the preceding year we had nearly been lost on the north of the mission of uruana there was to be an eclipse of the moon during the night and the next day an occultation of alpha virginis the observation of the latter phenomenon might have been very important in determining the longitude of cartagena in vain i urged the captain to allow one of his sailors to accompany me by land to the foot of boca chica a distance of five miles he objected on account of the wild state of the country in which there is neither habitation nor path a little incident which might have rendered palm sunday more fatal justified the prudence of the captain we went by moonlight to collect plants on the shore as we approached the land we saw a young negro issue from the thicket he was quite naked loaded with chains and armed with a machete he invited us to land on a part of the beach covered with large mangroves as being a spot where the surf did not break 
and offered to conduct us to the interior of the island of Baru if we would promise to give him some clothes. His cunning and wild appearance, the oft-repeated question whether we were Spaniards, and certain unintelligible words which he addressed to some of his companions, who are concealed amidst the trees, inspired us with some mistrust. These blacks were no doubt maroon negroes, slaves escaped from prison. This unfortunate class are much to be feared. They have the courage of despair, and a desire of vengeance excited by the severity of the whites. We were without arms. The negroes appeared to be more numerous than we were, and, thinking that possibly they invited us to land with a desire of taking possession of our canoe, we thought it most prudent to return on board. The aspect of a naked man, wandering on an uninhabited beach, unable to free himself from the chains fastened round his neck, and the upper part of his arm, was an object calculated to excite the most painful impressions. Our sailors wished to return to the shore for the purpose of seizing the fugitives, to sell them secretly at Cartagena. In countries where slavery exists, the mind is familiarized with suffering, and that instinct of pity which characterizes and ennobles our nature is blunted. Whilst we lay at anchor near the island of Baru in the meridian of Punta Gaijantes, I observed the eclipse of the moon of the 29th of March, 1801. The total immersion took place at 11 hours, 30 minutes, 12.6 seconds, mean time. Some groups of vapors scattered over the azure vault of the sky rendered the observation of the immersion uncertain. During the total eclipse, the lunar disk displayed, as almost always happens, a reddish tint without disappearing. The edges, examined with a sextant, were strongly undulating, notwithstanding the considerable altitude of the orb. It appeared to me that the moon was more luminous than I had ever seen it in the temperate zone. The vividness of the light, it may be conceived, does not depend solely on the state of the atmosphere, which reflects more or less feebly the solar rays, by inflecting them in the cone of the shade. The light is also modified by the variable transparency of that part of the atmosphere across which we perceive the moon eclipsed. Within the tropics, great serenity of the sky and a perfect dissolution of the vapors diminish the extinction of the light sent back to us by the lunar disk. I was singularly struck during the eclipse by the want of uniformity in the distribution of the refracted light by the terrestrial atmosphere. In the central region of the disk, there was a shadow like a round cloud, the movement of which was from east to west. The part where the immersion was to take place was consequently a few minutes prior to the immersion much more brightly illumined than the western edges. Is this phenomenon to be attributed to an inequality of our atmosphere, to a particular accumulation of vapor which, by absorbing a considerable part of the solar light, inflects less on one side the cone of the shadow of the earth? If a similar cause, in the perigree of central eclipses, sometimes renders the disk invisible, May it not happen, also, that only a small portion of the moon is seen, a disk, irregularly formed, and of which different parts were successively enlightened? On the morning of the 30th of March, we doubled Punta Gigantes, and made for the Boca Chica, the present entrance of the port of Cartagena. From thence, the distance is seven or eight miles, to the anchorage near the town, and although we took a practico to pilot us, we repeatedly touched on the sandbanks. On landing, I learned with great satisfaction that the expedition appointed to take the survey of the coast under the direction of Mr. Fidalgo had not yet put to sea. This circumstance not only enabled me to ascertain the astronomical position of several towns on the shore, which had served me as points of departure in fixing chronometrically the longitude of the Llanos and the Orinoco, but also served to guide me with respect to the future direction of my journey to Peru. The passage from Cartagena to Portobello, and that of the Isthmus by the Rio Chagres and Cruces, are alike short and easy. But it was to be feared that we might stay long at Panama before we found an opportunity of proceeding to Guayaquil, and in that case the voyage on the Pacific would be extremely lingering, as we should have to sail against contrary winds and currents. I relinquished with regret the hope of leveling by the barometer the mountains of the Isthmus, though it would then have been difficult to foresee that at the present time, 1827, while measurements have been effected on so many other points of Mexico and Colombia, we should remain in ignorance of the height of the ridge which divides the waters in the isthmus. 
the persons we consulted all agreed that the journey by land along the cordilleras by santa fe de bogota popoyan quito and cajamarca would be preferable to the sea voyage and would furnish an immense field for exploration the predilection of europeans for the tierras frias that is to say the cold and temperate climate that prevails on the back of the andes gave further weight to these counsels the distances were known but we were deceived with respect to the time it would take to traverse them on mules backs we did not imagine that it would require more than eighteen months to go from cartagena to lima notwithstanding this delay or rather owing to the slowness which we passed through cundinamarca the provinces of popayan and quito i did not regret having sacrificed the passage of the isthmus to the route of bogota for every step of the journey was full of interest both geographically and botanically this change of direction gave me occasion to trace the map of the rio magdalena to determine astronomically the position of eighty points situated in the inland country between cartagena popayan and the upper course of the river amazon and lima to discover the error in the longitude of quito to collect several thousand new plants and to observe on a vast scale the relations between the rocks of cyanitic porphyry and trachyte with the fire of volcanoes the result of those labors of which it is not for me to appreciate the importance have long since been published my map of the rio magdalena multiplied by the copies of the year eighteen o two in america and spain and comprehending the country between amaguer and santa marta from one degree fifty four minutes to eleven degrees fifteen minutes latitude appeared in eighteen sixteen till that period no traveller had undertaken to describe new granada and the public except in spain knew the navigation of the magdalena only by some lines traced by bourgeois that learned traveller had descended the river from honda but being in want of astronomical instruments he had ascertained but four or five latitudes by means of small dials hastily constructed the narratives of travels in america are now singularly multiplied political events have led numbers of persons to those countries and travellers have perhaps too hastily published their journals on returning to europe they have described the towns where they resided and landscape scenery remarkable for beauty they have furnished information respecting the inhabitants and the different modes of travelling in barks on mules or on men's backs these works several of which are agreeable and instructive have familiarized the nations of the old world with those of spanish america from buenos aires and chile as far as zacatecas and new mexico but unfortunately in many instances the want of a thorough knowledge of the spanish language and the little care taken to acquire the names of places rivers and tribes have occasioned extraordinary mistakes during the six days of our stay at cartagena our most interesting excursions were to the boca grande and the hill of popa the latter commands the town and a very extensive view the port or rather the bahia is nearly nine miles and a half long if we compute the length from the town near the suburb of hahamani or hishamani to the cienega de cacao the cienega is one of the nooks of the isle baru south-east of the estero de pascaballos by which we reach the opening of the diqua de mahates two extremities of the small island of tierra bomba form on the north with a neck of land of the continent and on the south with the cape of the island of baru the only entrances to the bay of cartagena the former is called boca grande the second boca chica this extraordinary conformation of the land has given birth for the space of a century to theories entirely contradictory respecting the defence of a place which next to the havana and porto cabello is the most important of the mainland and the west indies engineers differed with respect to the choice of the opening which should be closed and it was not as some writers have stated after the landing of admiral vernon in seventeen forty one that the idea was first conceived of filling up the boca grande note don jorge juan in his secret notices addressed to the marques de la ensenada says la entrada antiga era por un angosto canal que llama boca chica de resultas de esta invasión se acordó de jajioca y impasable la boca grande y volver a abrir la antiga fortificandola the old entrance was by a narrow canal called the boca chica 
but after this invasion it was determined to close up the boca grande and to open the old passage fortifying it secra not volume one page four end of note the english forced the small entrance when they made themselves masters of the bay but being unable to take the town of cartagena which made a gallant resistance they destroyed the castillo grande called also santa cruz and the two forts of san luis and san jose which defended the boca chica the apprehension excited by the proximity of the boca grande to the town determined the court of madrid after the english expedition to shut up the entrance along a distance of two thousand six hundred and forty varas from two and a half to three fathoms of water were found and a wall or rather a dike in stone from fifteen to twenty feet high was raised on piles the slope on the side of the water is unequal and seldom forty-five degrees this immense work was completed under the viceroy espeleta in seventeen ninety five but art could not vanquish nature the sea is unceasingly though gradually silting up the boca chica while it labours unceasingly to open and enlarge the boca grande the currents which during a great part of the year especially when the bendavales blow with violence ascend from south-west to north-east throw sand into the boca chica and even into the bay itself the passage which is from seventeen to eighteen fathoms deep becomes more and more narrow and if a regular cleansing be not established by dredging machines vessels will not be able to enter without risk Note, at the foot of the two forts san jose and san fernando constructed for the defence of the boca chica it may be seen how much the land has gained upon the sea necks of land are formed on both sides and also before the castillo del angel which northward commands the fort of san fernando End of note. It is the small entrance which should have been closed. Its opening is only two hundred and fifty toises, and the passage or navigable channel is one hundred and ten toises. If it should one day be determined to abandon the Boca Chica and re establish the Boca Grande in the state which nature seems to prescribe, new fortifications must be constructed on the south southwest of the town. This fortress has always required great pecuniary outlays to keep it up the insalubrity of cartagena varies with the state of the great marshes that surround the town on the east and north the cienega de tesca is more than fifteen miles long it communicates with the ocean where it approaches the village of guayaper when in years of drought the heaped-up earth prevents the salt water from covering the whole plain the emanations that rise during the heat of the day when the thermometer stands between twenty eight and thirty two degrees are very pernicious to the health of the inhabitants a small portion of hilly land separates the town of cartagena and the island of manga from the cienega de tesca those hills some of which are more than five hundred feet high command the town the castillo de san lazaro is seen from afar rising like a great rocky pyramid when examined nearer its fortifications are not very formidable layers of clay and sand belonging to the tertiary formation of nagelflu are covered with bricks and furnish a kind of construction which has little stability the cerro de santa marta de la popa crowned by a convent and some batteries rises above the fort of san lazaro and is worthy of more solid and extensive works the image of the virgin preserved in the church of the convent has been long revered by mariners the hill itself forms a prolonged ridge from west to east the calcareous rock with cardites meandrites and petrified corals somewhat resembles the tertiary limestone of the peninsula of araya near cumana it is split and decomposed in the steep parts of the rock and the preservation of the convent on so unsolid a foundation is considered by the people as one of the miracles of the patron of the place near the cerro de la popa there appears on several points breccia with a limestone cement containing angular fragments of lydian stone whether this formation of nagelflu is superposed on tertiary limestone of coral and whether the fragments of the lydian stone come from secondary limestone analogous to that of zacatecas and the moro de nueva barcelona are questions which i have not had leisure to investigate the view from the popa is extensive and varied and the windings and rents of the coast give it a peculiar character I was assured that sometimes, from the windows of the convent, and even in the open sea, before the fort of Boca Chica, the snowy tops of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta are discernible. 
the distance of the horqueta to the popa is seventy-eight nautical miles this group of colossal mountains is most frequently wrapped in thick clouds and it is most veiled at the season when the gales blow with violence although only forty-five miles distant from the coast it is of little service as a signal to mariners who seek the port of santa marta hidalgo during the whole time of his observations near the shore could take only one observation of the nevados a gloomy vegetation of cactus catropa gossipifolia croton and mimosa covers the barren declivity of the cerro de la popa in herbalizing in those wild spots our guides showed us a thick bush of acacia cornigera which had become celebrated by a deplorable event of all the species of mimosa the acacia is that which is armed with the sharpest thorns they are sometimes two inches long and being hollow serve for the habitation of ants of an extraordinary size a woman annoyed by the jealousy and well-founded reproaches of her husband conceived a project of the most barbarous vengeance with the assistance of her lover she bound her husband with cords and threw him at night into a bush of mimosa cornigera the more violently he struggled the more the sharp woody thorns of the tree tore his skin his cries were heard by persons who were passing and he was found after several hours of suffering covered with blood and dreadfully stung by the ants this crime is perhaps without example in the history of human turpitude it indicates a violence of passion less assignable to the climate than to the barbarism of manners prevailing among the lower class of the people my most important occupation at cartagena was the comparison of my observations with the astronomical positions fixed by the officers of the expedition of fidalgo in the year seventeen eighty three under the ministry of m valdez don josef espinosa don dionisio galeano and don josef de lanz proposed to the spanish government a plan for taking a survey of the coast of america in order to extend the atlas of tolfino to the western colonies the plan was approved but it was not until seventeen ninety two that an expedition was fitted out at cadiz and they were enabled to commence their scientific operations at the island of trinidad End of chapter three point thirty Chapter three point thirty one part one of Personal Narrative of Travels to the Equinoctial Regions of America during the years seventeen ninety nine to eighteen o four volume three by Alexander von Humboldt translated by Thomasina Ross. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter three point thirty one part one. I might enumerate among the causes of the lowering of the temperature at Cuba during the winter months the great number of shoals with which the island is surrounded and on which the heat is diminished several degrees of centesimal temperature this diminished heat may be assigned to the molecules of water locally cooled which go to the bottom to the polar currents which are borne toward the abyss of the tropical ocean or to the mixture of the deep waters with those at the surface at the declivities of the banks but the lowering of the temperature is partly compensated by the flood of hot water the gulf stream which runs along the northwest coast and the swiftness of which is often diminished by the north and northeast winds the chain of shoals which encircles the island and which appears on our maps like a penumbra is fortunately broken on several points and those interruptions afford free access to the shore in the southeast part the proximity of the lofty primitive mountains renders the coast more precipitous in that direction are situated the ports of santiago de cuba guantanamo by Tiqueri, and in turning the punta mesi baracoa the latter is the place most early peopled by europeans the entrance to the old channel from punta de mulas northwest of baracoa as far as the new settlement which has taken the name of puerto de las nuevitas del principe is alike free from shoals and breakers navigators find excellent anchorage a little to the east of punta de mulas in the three rocks of tanamo cabonico and nipe and on the west of Punta de Mulas, in the ports of Sama, Naranjo, Del Padre, and Nuevas Grandes. It is remarkable that near the latter port, almost in the same meridian where, on the south side of the island, are situated the shoals of Buena Esperanza and of Las Docheliguas, stretching as far as the island of Pinos, we find the commencement of the uninterrupted series of the chaos of the old channel, extending to the length 
of ninety-four leagues, from Nuevitas to Punta Icacos. The old channel is narrowest opposite to Cayo Cruz and Cayo Romano. Its breadth is scarcely more than five or six leagues. On this point, too, the great bank of Bahama takes its greatest development. The chaos near the island of Cuba, and those parts of the bank not covered with water, Long Island, Eleuthera, are like Cuba, of a long and narrow shape. Were they only twenty or thirty feet higher, an island much larger than St. Domingo would appear at the surface of the ocean. The chain of breakers and chaos that bound the navigable part of the old channel, towards the south, leave between the channel and the coast of Cuba small basins, without breakers, which communicate with several ports having good anchorage, such as Quanaja, Moron, and Remedios. Having passed through the old channel, or rather the channel of San Nicolas, between Cruz del Padre and the bank of the Chaos de Sel, the lowest of which furnish springs of fresh water, we again find the coast, from Punta de Icacos to Gabanas, free from danger. It affords in the interval the anchorage of Matanzas, Puerto Escondido, the Havana, and Mariel. Further on, westward of Bahia Honda, the possession of which might well tempt a maritime enemy of Spain, the chain of shoals recommences and extends without interruption as far as Cape San Antonio. Note, they are here called the Bajos de Santa Isabella y de los Colorados, end of note. From that cape to Punta de Piedras and Bahia de Cortes, the coast is almost precipitous and does not afford soundings at any distance, but between Punta de Piedras and Cabo Cruz, Almost the whole southern part of Cuba is surrounded with shoals, of which the Isle of Pinos is but a portion not covered with water. These shoals are distinguished on the west by the name of gardens, jardinas y jardinios, and on the east by the names of Cayo Breton, Cayos de las Dolce Liguas, and Bancos de Buena Esperanza. On all this southern line, the coast is exempt from danger, with the exception of that part which lies between the Strait of Cochinos and the mouth of the Rio Guaurabo. These seas are very difficult to navigate. I had the opportunity of determining the position of several points in latitude and longitude during the passage from Batabano to Trinidad of Cuba and to Cartagena. It would seem that the resistance of the currents of the highlands of the island of Pines and the remarkable outstretching of Cabo Cruz have at once favoured the accumulation of sand and the labours of the coralline polypes which inhabit calm and shallow water. Along this extent of the southern coast, a length of 145 leagues, only one-seventh affords entirely free access, namely that part between Cayo de Pietras and Cayo Blanco, a little to the east of Puerto Casilda. There are found anchorages often frequented by small barks, for example, the Surgidero del Batabano, Bahia de Jagua, and Puerto Casilda, or Trinidad de Cuba. Beyond this latter port, toward the mouth of the Rio Cauto and Cabo Cruz, behind the chaos to Dolce Leguas, the coast, covered with lagoons, is not very accessible, and is almost entirely desert. At the island of Cuba, as heretofore in all the Spanish possessions in America, we must distinguish between the ecclesiastic, politico-military, and financial divisions. We will not add those of the judicial hierarchy, which have created so much confusion amongst modern geographers, the island having but one audencia residing since the year seventeen ninety seven at puerto principe whose jurisdiction extends from baracoa to cape san antonio the division into two bishoprics dates from seventeen eighty eight when pope pius the sixth nominated the first bishop of the havana the island of cuba was formerly with louisiana and florida under the jurisdiction of the archbishop of san domingo and from the period of its discovery it had only one bishopric, founded in 1518, in the most western part, at Baracoa, by Pope Leo X. The translation of this bishopric to Santiago de Cuba took place four years later, but the first bishop, Fray Juan de Ubite, arrived only in 1528. In the beginning of the 19th century, 1804, Santiago de Cuba was made an archbishopric. The ecclesiastical limit between the diocese of the Havana and Cuba, passes in the meridian of Cayo Romano, nearly in the eighty and three-quarter degree of longitude west of Paris, between the Via de Santo Espiritu and the city of Puerto Principe. The island, with relation to its political and military government, is divided into two governios, depending on the same capitan general. 
the governo of the havana comprehends besides the capital the district of cuatro Vios, trinidad santo espiritu via clara and san juan de los remedios and the district of puerto principe the capitan general y gobernador of the havana has the privilege of appointing a lieutenant in puerto principe teniente gobernador as also at trinidad and nueva filipina the territorial jurisdiction of the capitan general extends as the jurisdiction of a corregidor to eight pueblos de ayuntamiento the cuidades of matanzas Jaruco, san felipe y santiago santa maria del rosario the villas of guanabacoa santiago de las vegas quinas and santiago de las baños the gobierno of cuba comprehends santiago de cuba baracoa hoquin and bayama the present limits of the gobineros are not the same as those of the bishoprics the district of puerto principe with its seven parishes for instance belonged till eighteen fourteen to the governo of the havana and the archbishopric of cuba in the enumerations of eighteen seventeen and eighteen twenty we find puerto principe joined with baracoa and bayamo in the jurisdiction of cuba it remains for me to speak of a third division altogether financial by the cedula of the twenty third march eighteen twelve the island was divided into three intendencias or provincias those of the havana puerto principe and santiago de cuba of which the respective length from east to west is about ninety seventy and sixty-five sea leagues the intendant of the havana retains the prerogatives of superintendente general subdelegado de real hacienda de la isla de cuba according to this division the provincia de cuba comprehends santiago de cuba baracoa Halguin, bayamo Chibara, manzanillo higuani cobre and tiguaros the provincia de puerto principe the town of that name nuevitas Hagua, santo espiritu san juan de los remedios via de santa clara and trinidad the most westerly intendencia or provincia de la havana occupies all that part situated west of the cuatro vias of which the intendant of the capital has lost the financial administration when the cultivation of the land shall be more uniformly advanced the division of the island into five departments namely the vuelta de abajo from cape san antonio to the fine village of guanaje and mariel the havana from mariel to alvarez the quinta vias from alvarez to moron puerto principe from moron to rio cauto and cuba from rio cauto to punta mesi will perhaps appear the most fit and most consistent with the historical remembrances of the early times of the conquest my map of the island of cuba however imperfect it may be for the interior is yet the only one on which are marked the thirteen cuidades and also the seven vias which are included in the divisions i have just enumerated the boundary between the two bishoprics linea divisoria de los dos obispados de la Havana y de santiago de cuba extends from the mouth of the small river of santa maria longitude eighty degrees forty nine minutes on the southern coast by the parish of san eugenio de la palma and by the haciendas of santa anna dos hermanos cope and cienega to la punta de judas longitude eighty degrees forty six minutes on the northern coast opposite queo romano during the regime of the spanish cortes it was agreed that this ecclesiastical limit should also be that of the two deputaciones provinciales of the havana and of santiago guia constitucional de la isla de cuba eighteen twenty two page seventy nine the diocese of the havana comprehends forty and that of cuba twenty two parishes having been established at a time when the greater part of the island was occupied by farms of cattle haciendas de ganado these parishes are of too great extent and little adapted to the requirements of present civilization the bishopric of santiago de cuba contains the five cities of baracoa cuba Hoquin, guisa puerto principe and the villa of bayamo in the bishopric of san cristobal de la havana are included the eight cities of the havana namely santa maria del rosario san antonio abad or de los baños san felipe y santiago de bejuca matanzas Jaruco, la paz and trinidad and the six villas of guanabacoa namely santiago de las vegas or compostela santa clara 
San Juan de los Remedios, Santo Espiritu, and San Julian de los Guinas. The territorial division most in favor among the inhabitants of the Havana is that of Vuelta de Arriba and de Abajo, east and west of the meridian of the Havana. The first governor of the island, who took the title of Capitan General, 1601, was Don Pedro Valdez. Before him there were sixteen other governors, of whom the series begins with the famous poblador and conquistador, Diego Velazquez, native of Quilar, who was appointed by Columbus in 1511. In the island of Cuba, free men compose 0.64 of the population, and in the English islands scarcely 0.19. In the whole archipelago of the West Indies, the copper-colored men, blacks and mulattoes, free and slaves, form a mass of 2,360,000, or 0.83 of the total population. If the legislation of the West Indies and the state of the men of color do not shortly undergo a salutary change, if the legislation continue to employ itself in discussion instead of action, the political preponderance will pass into the hands of those who have the strength to labor, will to be free, and courage to endure long privations. This catastrophe will ensue as a necessary consequence of circumstances, without the intervention of the free blacks of Haiti, and without their abandoning the system of insulation which they have hitherto followed. Who can venture to predict the influence which may be exercised on the politics of the New World by an African confederation of the free states of the West Indies, situated between Colombia, North America, and Guatemala? The fear of this event may act more powerfully on the minds of many than the principles of humanity and justice. But in every island the whites believe that their power is not to be shaken. All simultaneous action on the part of the blacks appears to them impossible, and every change, every concession granted to the slave population is regarded as a sign of weakness. The horrible catastrophe of San Domingo is declared to have been only the effect of the incapacity of its government. Such are the illusions which prevail amidst the great mass of the planters of the West Indies, and which are alike opposed to an amelioration of the condition of the blacks in Georgia and in the Carolinas. The island of Cuba, more than any other of the West India islands, might escape the common wreck. That island contains 455,000 free men and 160,000 slaves, and there, by prudent and humane measures, the gradual abolition of slavery might be brought about. Let us not forget that since San Domingo has become free, there are in the whole archipelago of the West Indies more free negroes and mulattoes than slaves. The whites, and above all the free men, whose cause it would be easy to link with that of the whites, take a very rapid numerical increase at Cuba. The slaves would have diminished since 1820 with great rapidity, but for the fraudulent continuation of the slave trade. If by the progress of human civilization and the firm resolution of the new states of free America, this infamous traffic should cease altogether. The diminution of the slave population would become more considerable for some time, on account of the disproportionate existing between the two sexes, and the continuance of emancipation. It would cease only when the relation between the deaths and births of slaves should be such that even the effects of enfranchisement would be counterbalanced. The whites and free men now form two-thirds of the whole population of the island, and this increase marks in some degree the diminution of the slaves. Among the latter, the women are to the men, exclusive of the mulatto slaves, scarcely in the proportion of one to four in the sugar-cane plantations, in the whole island as one to one point seven, and in the towns in Farina, where the negro slaves serve as domestics, or work by the day on their own account, as well as that of their masters, the proportion is as 1 to 1.4 even, for instance at the Havana, as 1 to 1.2. Note. It appears probable that at the end of 1825, of the total population of men of color, mulattoes and negroes, free and slaves, there were nearly 160,000 in the towns, and 230,000 in the fields. In 1811, the consulado, in a statement presented to the Cortes of Spain, computed at 141,000, the number of men of color in the towns, and 185,000 in the fields. Documentes sobre los negros, page 121. This great accumulation of mulattoes, free negroes and slaves, in the towns is a characteristic feature in the island of Cuba. End of note. 
the developments that follow will show that these proportions are founded on numerical statements which may be regarded as the limit numbers of the maximum the prognostics which are hazarded respecting the diminution of the total population of the island at the period when the slave trade shall be readily abolished and not merely according to the laws as since eighteen twenty respecting the impossibility of continuing the cultivation of sugar on a large scale and respecting the approaching time when the agricultural industry of cuba shall be restrained to plantations of coffee and tobacco and the breeding of cattle are founded on arguments which do not appear to me to be perfectly just instead of indulging in gloomy presages the planters would do well to wait till the government shall have procured positive statistical statements the spirit in which even very odd enumerations were made for instance that of seventeen seventy five by the distinction of age sex race and state of civil liberty deserves high commendation nothing but the means of execution were wanting it was felt that the inhabitants were powerfully interested in knowing partially the occupations of the blacks and their numerical distribution in the sugar settlements farms and towns to remedy evil to avoid public danger to console the misfortunes of a suffering race who are feared more than is acknowledged the wound must be probed for in the social body when governed by intelligence there is found as in organic bodies a repairing force which may be opposed to the most inveterate evils in the year eighteen eleven the municipality and the tribunal of commerce of the havana computed the total population of the island of cuba to be six hundred thousand including three hundred and twenty six thousand people of color free or slaves mulattoes or blacks at that time nearly three-fifths of the people of color resided in the jurisdiction of the havana from cape san antonio to alvarez in this part it appears that the towns contain as many mulattoes and free negroes as slaves but that the colored population of the towns was to that of the fields as two to three in the eastern part of the island on the contrary from alvarez to santiago de cuba and cape maisie the men of color inhabiting the towns nearly equaled in number those scattered in the farms from eighteen eleven till the end of eighteen twenty five the island of cuba has received along the whole extent of its coast by lawful and unlawful means one hundred and eighty five thousand african blacks of whom the custom house of the havana only registered from eighteen eleven to eighteen twenty about one hundred and sixteen thousand this newly introduced mass has no doubt been spread more in the country than in the towns it must have changed the relations which persons well informed of the localities had established in eighteen eleven between the eastern and western parts of the island between the towns and the fields the negro slaves have much augmented in the eastern plantations but the fact that notwithstanding the importation of one hundred and eighty five thousand bozal negroes the mass of men of color free and slaves has not augmented from eighteen eleven to eighteen twenty five more than sixty four thousand or one fifth shows that the changes in the relation of partial distribution are restrained within narrower limits than one would at first be inclined to admit the proportions of the castes with respect to each other will remain a political problem of high importance till such time as a wise legislation shall have succeeded in calming inveterate animosities and in granting equality of rights to the oppressed classes in eighteen eleven the number of whites in the island of cuba exceeded that of the slaves by sixty two thousand whilst it nearly equalled the number of the people of color both free and slaves the whites who in the french and english islands formed at the same period nine hundredths of the total population amounted in the island of cuba to forty five hundredths the free men of color amounted to nineteen hundredths that is double the number of those in jamaica and martinique the numbers given in the enumeration of eighteen seventeen modified by the deputation provinciale being only one hundred and fifteen thousand seven hundred freed men and two hundred and twenty five thousand three hundred slaves the comparison proves first that the freed men have been estimated with little precision either in eighteen eleven or in eighteen seventeen and secondly that the mortality of the negroes is so great that notwithstanding the introduction of more than sixty seven thousand seven hundred african negroes registered at the custom house there were only thirteen thousand three hundred more slaves in eighteen seventeen 
than in 1811. In 1817, a new enumeration was substituted for the approximative estimates attempted in 1811. From the census of 1817, it appears that the total population of the island of Cuba amounted to 572,363. The number of whites was 257,380. Of free men of color, 115,691. And of slaves, 199,292. In no part of the world where slavery prevails is emancipation so frequent as in the island of Cuba. The Spanish legislature favors liberty instead of opposing it, like the English and the French legislatures. The right of every slave to choose his own master, or set himself free, if he can pay the purchase money, the religious feeling which disposes many masters in easy circumstances to liberate some of their slaves, the habit of keeping a multitude of blacks for domestic service, the attachments which arise from this intercourse with the whites, the facility with which slaves who are mechanics accumulate money, and pay their masters a certain sum daily in order to work on their own account. Such are the principal causes which in the towns convert so many slaves into free men of color. I might add the chances of the lottery and games of hazard, but that too much confidence in those means often produces the most fatal effects. End of chapter 3.31 Part 1